There we go. All right, so let's look at our solution here for this quiz. So the idea is we're supposed to write a function called add nums. So it's going to return a number. Add nums takes in two numbers, something like that. So something in the ballpark of like that for the quiz. If you left the curly braces off, that's fine because I didn't actually ask you to implement it. So if you just wrote the header, that's good enough. But two parameters, comma delimited list. They have to have types associated with them. So we have one that's a number A, another one that's a number B. Name of the function is add nums, returns an int. Uh, if you left the static off, that's fine as well, since I haven't really given you good context for what that means. Static is not always there, but in our world right now, it is. All right, so questions about that? All right, so now that we learned last time, kind of the, uh, uh, what is that, I guess the Rosetta Stone for... Uh, uh, for the Java language relative to, uh, to Alice. Now we can actually start writing stuff in Java using the programming as a skill set logic that we've already learned relative to Alice. All right, so we're going to start off by writing a... We decided we're going to do tic-tac-toe kind of the Java way. Uh, just so we have reference to this, I'm going to cut that stuff. I'm going to put it all the way down here at the very bottom. So at the very, very, very bottom of my class, I put a multi-line uh, comment. So a slash asterisk starts a comment. An asterisk slash ends a comment. So all this stuff is going to be ignored by the Java compiler. It's for human eyes only. Okay, if you want a single line comment, That's just slash slash. And you can put a little single line comment that maybe describes what a variable's for or something like that. Um, now, this is something we really didn't have in Alice. So as our program got more and more complex, uh, we didn't really have the ability to, you know, comment our code and you can kind of get out of, you can add notes over to the side, right? Okay, but it didn't wasn't in line. You couldn't really see it in line. I don't think it's in line. Um, Game Salad, the tool we used to use, would allow you to name your function something and then you could actually write a little paragraph in there underneath it. Um, but punchline is, is that a lot of programming classes, they start off and say you should comment every line. Totally disagree with that. All right, we want our, uh, so a phrase that I uh, uh, often use and something you'll read about sometimes is this idea that you want to write self-documenting code. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean you never put comments. Self-documenting code effectively says, name your functions in meaningful ways. Name your variables something meaningful. Don't create a variable named X, Y, Z when you're actually holding somebody's first name. Name it first name. <laughs> so at a glance, you know what that variable likely means. Okay. Now, when you get to sections of the code where you're doing something kind of weird, Okay? Or there's a function that maybe does five or six things that you, the name of it doesn't capture the whole idea. That's where you add in the comments. Okay? Because if you have comments after every single line of code, all of a sudden the comments get lost in the sea of comments. That makes sense? So you do want to use comments in your code, but use them where it's appropriate to have comments. Don't just put comments in to put comments. If you're ever at the end of writing some software, if you're ever asking yourself, well... Did I meet the minimum number of comments required for this assignment? Well, first of all, if you ever have a teacher that gives you the minimum number of uh, comments that are required for an assignment, I probably would drop. I would keep that as a you know, that, that doesn't seem right to me. But in any case, uh, the number, the minimum number of comments you should have for a project is whatever is the right number of comments to have for the project. Just like when somebody says, write a paper that does something, and you say, well, how long does it need to be? Long enough. I never understood that either. Like, you know, when teachers give a paper that says it has to be, you know, three to five pages or something like that. I mean, I can understand if you want to give some sort of minimal length so somebody doesn't give you a sentence. But as long as you've described well enough, like, what the goal of the paper is, you know, here's the concept I'm asking you to research. 
tell me about this in terms of these four points. If you can do that in a page, great. If you can do that in 14 pages, I don't know if I want to read 14 pages, but you know, it should be long enough to accomplish the goal, right? I mean, how many of you have ever had to write a paper that the teacher said it needs to be a five-page paper, and at page one and a half, you're like, okay, I'm out of crap to say. And then you're just looking for filler, right? Who wants to read filler? It's just garbage. It's complete garbage. All right, so we want to start off here. We're going to write a function that displays what we're going to have as our initial facsimile of a tic-tac-toe board. Okay? Um, so we want to kind of start thinking about this world of tic-tac-toe that we've already, uh, um, you know, been considering, so we're not resolving large problems. But now we want to think about it in the context of the Java world, where we're no longer having to solve the problem in terms of monkey kings and mad hatters and things like that. We can solve things using the tools that are afforded to us in, in Java. But we're also going to do this in a text-based manner. So we don't have all this stuff that looks appealing on the screen. Instead, it's all just going to be boring looking text. All right. So we're going to start off. We're going to have a method called uh, that's going to be static. Don't worry about that for right now. It's actually not going to return anything. And we're just going to call this guy display board. And for starters, we're going to hard code our board in here, what our board should look like. All right. So we can kind of go back a couple of... Uh, um, so I'm thinking maybe what our board looks like in tic-tac-toe is uh, three rows with maybe, you know, three underscores in each row or maybe double underscores with some spaces in between, something like something like that. Um, so I'm going to do a system.out.println and uh, we're going to put in a row. So we're going to do double underscore and then I'm going to do a backslash T. That's a tab character. So backslash T is ignored in terms of output, but is uh, treated as a tab. Backslash N is treated as the carriage return. Um, so those are kind of two common ones. So I'll do underscore, underscore, backslash T, underscore, underscore, backslash T, underscore, underscore. So that'll be one row, and then we're going to do this two additional times. All right, and that should be our um, display board function. So if I run this program right now, what will the output of this program be? I'm asking you to re I'm asking you to rely on your knowledge from Alice and apply it to Java. So all programs begin and end with main. We have a starting point. So we have an untapped resource here. We've written a function that will do something, but we never actually called that function, right? So we're going to call upon that function now. So I'm going to say driver dot display board. This function being static, and this isn't something I'm going to ask you about in this class. It's something we drilled pretty well. Not right. You're not going to be responsible for this material right this second because I'm going to have to show you the alternative to this later. But this static keyword makes this function what's called a class function. Static makes this function a class function. Class functions are owned by the class in which they were defined. In this case, that's the class called driver. So we call that function using the name of the class, driver.displayboard. In our world right now, that's all we know about. Okay, We've kind of seen some stuff when we were doing all the Monkey King stuff and things like that in Java, but we're going to roll back and pretend like we haven't seen that yet. That's more foreshadowing where we're going. But for right now, this is what functions look like. This is how we call them. The driver technically is not required. You can just call it like that because the current context we are in is a static context. So inside of main... I am in the I'm in a function that's owned by the class, so that means whenever I call a function, it's assumed that it's the class calling it. So I don't actually need driver. The biggest reason I like to put in driver in this case is for spelling. So now I can just go down and say, oh, display board. I don't have to type the whole thing. So it's the command completion stuff that makes life a little bit easier. All right, so now that we are actually calling upon our function, if we go ahead and hit play, there is our tic-tac-toe board with some tabs between it. All right, now at this point, this is a hard-coded tic-tac-toe board. 
The reality is, is that as we're playing tic-tac-toe here, we probably want either X's or O's to start showing up in here, right? All right, in fact, it might make the most sense for us to do three tabs so that we can, or three underscores, so we can have that uh, middle one get replaced with either the X or the O. Hopefully, I'll make it look a little more consistent once we start uh, going. But whatever. So that's going to be our tic-tac-toe board. But right now, we're hard coding it, where we really want to generate this guy in terms of the uh, uh, the current state of the board. Does that make sense? So what we're going to do is we need to keep track of this is a row, this is a row, and this is a row. And we need to hold up to three pieces of information for each of those. Three strings, three pieces of text. Okay, One string, could uh, well, default, they're all going to be underscores. Okay, But then we're going to change it where there might be an underscore x underscore for one of the rows columns. So we're going to need three variables. And these are going to be arrays, collections of things. All right. So we're actually going to store these arrays as collections of chars. Because we really want to keep track of X's, O's, or no move. Make sense? Okay, that's what we want to keep track of. So we're going to create a, uh, our initial board. And uh, so we're going to have a char array called row 1. And we're going to hard code this stuff in here. So row 1 is going to have an initial... set up like that, and we're going to interpret what an underscore means. Underscore means no move. We have not made a move there yet. Just like in uh, Alice, we kept track of was a move made, that type of thing. Okay, so that's going to be row one. Then we'll have row two. We'll have row three. All right, so there's our three rows. I should start to uh, get the caffeine going here. All right, so now let's go ahead and let's dynamically print out our board in terms of those three arrays. We're not changing the values in those arrays yet, but let's get the equivalent board displayed in terms of those three arrays. So for right now, we will leave this top board here so we have something to compare it to. So we'll print out the hard-coded board and then we'll print out our dynamic board underneath it and hopefully we get two identical looking boards before we remove this other piece. All right, so what we want to do is we want to deal with each of our three rows. So we have row one, row two, and row three. And we want to loop through every element of this array, asking if it's an underscore or if it's something else. All right, so if we want, we can put some other things in here, but we'll go ahead and ask the question. So if it's an underscore, we're going to translate that into three underscores. If it's an O, we're going to translate that into an underscore O underscore. If it's an X, we're going to translate that into an underscore X underscore. Make sense? So that's what we're going to interpret the contents of those arrays as. So we need our loop that's going to go through every element of our array. So we can say four int i is equal to zero, i is less than row one dot What is the issue here? Oh, these need to be static. I'm in a static context. So again, just put static in front of everything for the moment. And this probably should say i is equal to i plus 1 for right now. All right, so now we're going to ask the question about each of these things. Okay, we know there's three of them in there. So we're going to say if row one at bucket i is equal to an underscore. Okay, so if I'm looking at an underscore, this is how we test for equivalence, double equal signs. Let's add that to our 
uh, our list down here. Boolean operators. Double equal sign is equivalence. Not equal to. Uh, then we have the less than, the greater than, those guys. So we'll leave it at that for right now. So if the current column we're looking at in row one is equal to the underscore, then what we're going to do is we're going to print out system.out.print. So print lin, print something, it kicks it down a line. Print keeps it on the same line. So we're going to print something. What are we going to print? We're going to print out underscore, underscore, underscore. Followed by a tab. Okay, That's what we do if we see underscores. Else if row 1 at bucket i is equal to an x, we'll put in our x. Else must have been an O. All right, so three states that we can have for each of those. It can be an underscore, it can be an X, it can be an O, and we'll respond accordingly for each of those. So that's what we do for row one. We would duplicate this for row two. We would duplicate that for row three. But let's go ahead and run this real quick and just make sure that row one duplicates this part right here. And we don't need this final tab. It's not going to hurt anything. Let's just run it for the moment. So here's row one, and here's our dynamically generated row one. Looks the same. So far, so good. We can prove that everything is legit. If we go up here and we put an X here, we put an O here, and now we'll see that we get X's and O's on that last one. All right, so a little bit better than shrunk or not shrunk monkey kings who change color. I don't know if that's better or worse, but looks more like tic-tac-toe at least. All right, so we'll go back to our underscores here. Now we can certainly repeat this code again for our various rows, but since we're repeating something multiple times, why shouldn't we write a function that knows how to process an individual row and turns it into this? Okay, so what I'm going to do here is we're going to write a, uh, another function. We'll call this guy static void display row. And display row is going to take in a char array as a parameter. We'll call it row. Okay, it's going to take in a char array as a parameter. <clears throat> I'm going to take all of this code here and we'll put it inside of display row. And then wherever we say row one, we'll change it to row. All right. Okay, so whatever row we pass in here as input to display row, it's gonna go through that row, each of the columns, it makes the assumption there's, well, it doesn't make the assumption that we're, because it is operating off the length of the row, the number of elements that are in that row and it's processing it depending on what the current status of each of those are. And what we will do here at the end is we're going to do a system.out.println and then just print out the empty string. That'll kick it down a line. Otherwise, we since we did all prints in here, it'll just be sitting at the very end of the, the previous line. We'll just have all the rows right next to each other. So visually, we want it to kick down a line. So this is how we display a row now. So in here, we can say driver dot display row, and we want to go ahead and display row one. We should see we've got the same output as we, ooh. oh, I have it inside the loop. We want to 
after we're done doing all of those columns, we want to kick it down a line, not each time through. So we put this outside of our loop. So this will process the three columns, then we'll jump down a line. So there's our mimicking there, which then allows us to go and do this again. We'll row two, row three. Now we should get our duplicates, and then we can go ahead and take out our hard-coded board. So there's our dynamically generated tic-tac-toe board. And we've already seen if I come up here and I make some modifications, that it's dynamically building that board based on the state of those three arrays. So far, so good. All right, so we'll go back to the... All right, so this is displaying a row, this is displaying a board, displaying a board just throw, shows our three rows. All right, so now we need to be able to get information in from our user. What, uh, uh, what, what move do they wanna make? Well, how are we going to put in current moves? We probably need to put in rows by columns, right? So we can just assume that this is uh, row one or row zero, however we want to think about it. This is probably row zero, row one, row two. This is uh, column zero, column one, column two. In our game before, we did this by count, right? This was the first element, the second element, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, something like that. So maybe we want to give it the grid location of where these guys live. But in order to do anything, we need to be able to read something in from the user. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to create a function, get info from the user. And this guy is going to return a integer that is a position. So let's say get int from user. So it's going to be static int, get int from user. So notice, I really didn't need a comment here because I named the function something reasonable. Make sense? So I'll go ahead and dump that comment. It's not wrong, but it's probably just throwing an extra comment in there. All right, so in order to get an integer from a user, we need to set up the ability to read something in from our user. And we do this, I think we'd already done this in the other thing, so we use a scanner to do this. So we're gonna build our scanner around standard input, which is the keyboard. I'll need to go ahead and import. Oh. So I'll import scanner. And then what I'll go ahead and do is I'm gonna say return input.nextint. So I'll get an integer from the user. We just created it as a local function for us to use. So right now we are writing, remember we talked about this last time, we're writing our entire program as a procedural program. One monolithic main, if you remember from uh, what we talked about earlier in the semester. So everything is happening inside of this one class, all right, and we just are splitting it into different functions, but we're still calling them from this one one internal housing rather than having classes, objects that have stuff in them. All right, so we'll get her in from the user. So now I'm going ahead and I'm displaying my board up here, but let's do a proof of concept here. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get in a piece of information from our user. Uh, we're gonna get the row and we're gonna get the column. All right, so we're gonna say system.out.print Please enter a row. Int row is going to be equal to driver dot get int from user. Then we'll say please enter a column. And there's our column. Get int from user. 
And then what we're going to do is we want to be able to make that move. So when we make a move, we're going to tell it which row and which column we're going to. Now, let's go ahead and let's assume that uh, as human beings, we're going to be putting in row one, row two, row three, column one, column two, column three. But arrays, this is bucket zero, bucket one, bucket two. So those things might be off depending on how we're answering this. Are we answering that question as programmers or are we answering that question as humans? A little bit different. Humans will count one, two, three. Programmers will start with a base of, of zero. All right, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to have a static function called make move uh, that takes in a uh, int row, an int column, and then a char move for which character we're making the move. Okay. And this guy is not going to return anything. He's just going to modify our arrays. And now we need to figure out which row we're dealing with. So if row is uh, zero, we're going to, uh, well, if row is one, we'll choose row one. If row is two, we'll choose row two, choose row two, so on and so forth. All right, so what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to say if row is equal to one, we want to do stuff with row, uh, row one. So what we're going to do is we're going to create some variables here to hold a pointer to the actual row we're going to go to. So we're going to create a char array called the row. We're going to create a char array called the column. And if row is equal to one, if the value we passed in was equal to one, we're going to set the row equal to row one. Else if row is equal to two, we'll set the row equal to two. Else if row is equal to three, we'll set the row equal to three. So after we've gone through this little minefield here, the row will be equal to the row we're making the move on. Make sense? Similarly, we'll ask the same questions about our columns. If column is equal to one, the column is equal to well, uh, actually, we are not going to, we, we, we're not doing as a two-dimensional array. We're doing as, as three one-dimensional arrays. So we don't even need to deal with that with columns right now. All right, so we have our column value. So we won't need that guy. So what we want to do right now is we're not even going to test to see if it was a legal move. We're just going to allow them to make the move, right? Which potentially will allow them to overwrite X's with O's and, and stuff like that. So now that we know what row they're uh, putting in, we're also going to assume the row they've entered is a, is a legal row. What we'll go ahead and do is we're going to say the row at bucket column minus one is equal to move. Now, why did I say column minus one? And this is going to yell at me and say, by the way, the row might not have had a value in it. So why don't we just do this? We'll assume they entered in row one unless we prove otherwise. So we'll set the row equal to row one initially. Then we'll check row, and if it was two or three, we'll modify the value of the row accordingly. Because it was yelling at me saying, here, let me just go back. I'll show you the, 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 the yell. When I have it like this, it's complaining that this value may not have been initialized is there is no guarantee that I will get inside of any of these if statements. We know that because of the way we're going to use this program that we will as people. But Java has no way of guaranteeing that. Okay, so Java, as far as it's concerned, we might get to this line having never gotten inside any of these if statements. Make sense? We could fix that by changing this just to an else. Now it's okay with it. Because it knows that 
this is the, the if all else fails, we'll, we'll go in there. All right, but that other approach, I think, is actually a, a fairly reasonable one. So we'll start the row off at row one. And then we'll try to prove that guess wrong. We think it'll be row one. If it's not, then it's either row two or row three. All right, so then the question I asked was, why are we saying column minus one here is equal to move? We've decided that as a user, we're going to enter in, when they ask us what row, we're going to say one, two, or three. When it asks us what column, we're going to say one, two, or three. But I'm saying that when we set our move, we're setting it for the row that we selected, based on what we did up here, at column, whatever they entered, minus one. So if I entered in a column of one, in programming terms, that actually means bucket zero of my row. That's where the first column is. That makes sense? That's why I'm saying column minus one here. This is a choice we're making. Because if we are, we're really, this choice here says that we're expecting the user to enter in a one-based index for the column. We're expecting the people to act like humans rather than act like programmers. Once you've completely gone to the dark side, you'll start thinking in terms of zero index, but most people think in terms of one index, right? All right, so this will make our move. So we'll go ahead and say driver dot make move. We'll pass in the row, we'll pass in the column, and we'll make the move as an X. So this should allow them to make that move. And then we'll go ahead and have it display the board again. All right, so we'll go ahead and run this. There's the initial board. It wants me to enter in a row. So let's go ahead and let's pick row two. And then a column. So we'll pick column two. So this will put it right in the middle. And there's my X at row two, column two. Make sense? Okay. Now, uh, let's leave that at that for right now. So let's, what you're going to end up doing for your homework assignment, and I'm going to give you this code as a starting point is we are going to uh, add in a function, static void play game. And this guy is going to toggle between the X and O player, asking each one to make moves indefinitely. So we can overwrite X's and O's, just basically we're, we're adding stuff to the board, right? The new board should be shown after each move. All right, so we're just proving the mechanics of the board. All right, make sure it makes sense what I'm asking you to do. All right, so now I need to teach you how to, how to submit your homework. So now, we're, now that we've become real programmers, we're going to use a tool called GitHub. All right. So last uh, five minutes here, I'm going to show you how to use GitHub. There are plenty of tools out there that allow you to do this, but I'm actually going to do it the command line way that will work for every one of you. You won't like it, but getting used to using the command line as a computer scientist is beneficial. All right. So the website is github.com. All right, and this is going to be how you will start turning in your programming assignments from this point forward for the next uh, four years, for those of you who are just starting off in computer science. All right, and for those of you who are a CS minor or something like that, GitHub is a tool that you'll use all over the place when you get into uh, uh, industry, when people are distributing software and stuff like that. So for lack of a, a better description, GitHub is the free way of distributing software applications between uh, people and they've set themselves up as the industry standard for this 
with their business model being this. Once everybody is used to using GitHub, it's for something called source control, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. Sometimes you want your projects to be private. For instance, if I'm working on a software application that I'm selling somebody, I probably don't want the entire world to be able to see it. That's when I have to pay GitHub for private repositories. We're going to be using public repositories. Okay? What's going to be nice about that is for those of you when you're working on your homework assignments, if you're collaborating with other uh, classmates, you can send them your GitHub link and say, this is the code I currently have. Do you see what's wrong with it? That also opens things up to cheating, but I'll find out about it on the exams. All right, so I don't really, I'm not going to sit there and nitpick on cheating because it's just a waste of everybody's time. It's, we already have your money. So if you choose to not learn anything, that's on, <laughs> that's, that's on you, I suppose. Um, so uh, anyways, this is the website for GitHub. So this is the process you'll go through for uh, submitting your homework assignment. So pay attention for the last four minutes here. So once you create your account on GitHub, so when you first come to the site, you can sign up with Facebook or anything like that or create your own account. You'll come up to this little plus sign here for create new. We're going to create a new repository. The repository we're going to create here, I'm going to call it uh, CSC 200 uh, Spring uh, 2016 Tic Tac Toe. All right, that's what I'm going to call that guy. And then we're going to go ahead and I'm going to just click Create Repository. And it's going to give me all these funky instructions. You're going to want to leave those up for now. I'm going to show you how to use each of these, and I actually ignore a few of these. All right, so now what you're going to do, for those of you who are Mac users, you don't have to install anything special. Get GitHub. Git. The tool that GitHub uses, it's a, it's a web-based front end for a tool called Git, G-I-T. Okay, and Git is what's called source, a source control tool. So it allows you to keep track of all the changes you've ever made to your software. So as we keep updating Tic-Tac-Toe, I'll keep pushing new changes to our repository so you'll be able to see all states of the changes we've ever made. For you, you're just going to be using it to submit your homework. Okay, and then what you're going to do is give me the link in the end. All right, so if you're a Mac user, you're going to uh, um, just get, uh, you just, just follow the instructions I'm going to show you. If you're a PC user, uh, get Windows. So here's the git.com, downloading it. So uh, just do the, um, if you just do a search for git space windows, it'll take you to this. It's going to take you to either 32 or 64-bit windows setup. Ultimately, what it's going to do is it's going to give you an icon that you can click on that will take you to a screen that basically looks like this. Okay, command line thing. Not to be confused with the DOS command line that you're maybe used to using on Windows. It's a different application. All right, so once you've gotten to this point, whether you're a Windows user or a Mac user, we are going to go ahead and we need to move into the directory where our uh, stuff lives. So I think for, well, let's just go here. I think I keep everything in Dropbox. See, oh, we just called it tic tac toe, right? All right, so it'll eventually get you to a position like this. So you'll do cd, cd takes you into the different directories, and then it's going to get us in here. And I'm going to go into the directory called source. That's where all our Java files live. All right, now. For our assignment here, we're only going to use the driver.java one, but I'm going to go ahead and commit the whole project just so we have everything in there. So we start off by, and you can follow those commands that I'm about to type in right here. It tells us exactly what to type. The only one I'm going to skip is this one right here. I don't add the readme. So I'm going to do a git init. It's going to take me there. And what that just did is it created a new little folder in here called uh, git. I'm going to do a git add dot. That will add everything to my git repository. And if you want to prove that, you can type in git status. Shows that we have a bunch of new files. Then I'm going to do a git commit dash m initial commit. 
This is doing it only locally. I'm committing the, those files to my local repository. The next thing, we only have to do this one time. I need to let my local Git repository know about GitHub. So this is the thing on GitHub that we just created. So this is the Git remote. Paste that in there. And then finally, we'll actually push it up to GitHub. So that's the Git push dash U. That guy right there. It'll go up on GitHub. The very first time you do this, you'll have to type in your GitHub username and password there, and then it'll remember it from that point forward. So now, if I click on this, you see our code is up there. So for the assignment, I'll give you this link so you can get there. You'll be able to go to driver.java, and you can just copy this code to into your Eclipse project to, as your starting point. Make sense? All right, so that is due on Monday. Just write the function that allows you to make moves over and over again, but toggles back and forth between X and L. All right, I will see everybody on Monday.